like to our guests. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, we appreciate um, interest, community interest in the um, work that we do. So the focus of tonight's meeting, um, we're starting even though we do not have a um, quorum. So um, we won't be able to vote until uh, we have at least one more member arrives. But we can start um, by just uh, with our farm to school presentation. So the focus of the meeting is a review of a couple of uh, executive limitations reports, so sort of the monitoring reports that Lane presents us with. We have 2.1 and 2.2. Um, we have a budget preview of 2020, and we have um, something about the farm to school program. Um, I've asked Rachel today to be our meeting evaluator. Um, we usually start the meeting with an opportunity for public comment. We will have a second um, public comment period after, I believe it's right after the um, budget preview. So um, if you have something specifically about the budget, you might want to wait. Um, but I open up um, for public comment. All right, hearing none. <laughs> Does anyone have anything specific? All right. Um, are you ready with the farm to school um, presentation? Yeah. Okay, great. Miss, <laughs> Missy Axelrod, our farm to school yes. coordinator. Nice to meet you. I like the way the first name is spelled. <laughs> Sorry to hold you up. Thank you so much for having us um, to learn a little bit about what's happening at the SU level with farm to school. Um, so a little bit of, of a background on myself. I live in Roxbury, I'm a farmer, and I've been doing farm school work for the last seven or eight years in central Vermont, and it's a great passion of mine, and I'm really excited to have started working with your SU last January. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of overview about farm school in general, and then a little bit about what's happening at the SU level. And we have a student here to share a little bit as well. So, Farm to School has become a national program, uh, really rooted here in Vermont first. Vermont has really been the leader that shaped the USDA program. And in Vermont, we have a, the Vermont Farm to School Network, and right now it is Farm to School Month, so it's a really great time to share with you. Um, so the Vermont Farm to School Network um, is about catalyzing change and through students, through the ground up. Um, food affects just about everything. And really, when we think about our students, if they don't have food in their stomach, they're not going to be able to learn. So that's really a, a huge piece of learning about what, are food, what, kid, what kids are eating at home before they come here. And what are they eating here, and how is it helping them grow? Um, so just kind of one little picture, a global view of food. farms and farmers to our schools. About 75% um, percent of schools currently in Vermont are integrated with farm school programs in one way or another. It could be as simple as having a couple gardens or even deeper. And through the network, we're looking at pushing that up to 80%, 85% by 2020. So it's a really huge statewide effort, both at the government level as well as grassroots for helping schools bring that to the table at schools. So we focus on farm to school, both here at the SU level and statewide, on the three C's, classroom, curriculum, and community. And those three, the three C's are really a great simple way to look at it because they're all connected, but they're all really strong on their own as well. But without one, we can't really have the other. Um, so with community, we really want to look at not just inside the school, but outside, everywhere, in our own towns, at the SU level, and at the state level, and then of course nationally as well. Uh, but most local to home, the SU has a great harvest dinner at Randolph Elementary School every year, which I'm going to give you a little bit more of a plug at the end, because that's coming up soon. It's really a great way to get parents, grandparents, um, 
non-family members to the cafeteria to experience food together as one huge community family and to highlight our kitchen staff as well as school gardens um, and their harvest. Um, community looks at life experiences, getting kids to the farm and learning about work ethics and skills, um, farmers and field trips, and bringing farmers not only you know, kids to the farm, but farmers into the classroom, and developing gardens. And every school at SU has gardens, which is really exciting. Um, currently at Randolph, one of the classes are working on a new plan for expanding the current garden, and they are gonna be looking at a budget and material needs, and then they're gonna help write a couple little grants and ask for community donations. Um, to help build that, and that's going to really be their project with um, community support. And then the same thing's happening at all the other schools as well. And so here's a picture of one community event that happened as a collaboration um, between several other organizations as well as our Farm to School program. This summer, it was the first Friday of the first week of school, and this happened at the library in Randolph, and it was a summer supper where people signed up to bring raw ingredients and then everybody prepared it together, both seniors, parents, young kids, and then we all ate it together. So it was a really great way to celebrate farmers and people's gardens and to be together in the community. So that was a partnership between the Farm to School program, the library, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, um, Stores of Town uh, supported it as well. And then curriculum is a really important part because if we just bring them to the farm and say, hey, check out your farm, and then they come back to school and then we don't talk about it again, it's not going to have that deep connection to curriculum. And so there's always work um, happening at the teacher level for integrating farm to school into the standards. Um, one really great example that's happening currently at Randolph, um, the school next class received an extra um, some extra funding through a USDA Farm to School grant that we applied for at the state level and received. And she is um, doing a Farm to School, Know Your Farmer, Know Your School project. It's a pilot project, first one in the country that's happening. And she's going for an extended visit with her whole class to Silloway Farms in Randolph Center. And they're going to be going there at least four times and they're integrating it with their Vermont History curriculum. Um, as well as many other parts of the standards, but that's the main emphasis. And then they also received a um, artist in residency grant, and they're going to be um, having an artist come in in uh, December to kind of help compile their whole curriculum on the farm. And then they're going to be creating an old fashioned cranky, which is like an old fashioned picture show, and they'll be performing it to the community. Um, so it's kind of this great way of integrating all the curriculum. Um, and then looking um, currently, we're at the Braintree, Brookfield, and at the high school level, we're gonna be applying for a collaborative Vermont agency um, of food and uh, markets grant. So they offer an annual farm to school grant, and so we're gonna be working on that. Um, and that will help us really focus on curriculum as well. Um, here is an example of a student dressing up as a cow while learning about dairy in the classroom and all the parts. This is the tech center with their pumpkin harvest and they supply a lot of their food to a CSA and we're really working on a collaboration with them and they're going to help develop school gardens um, at a deeper level. So they have, they're learning the skills and then they're going to get to teach it to the younger kids. And then the cafeteria um, is another, the, the last three C, where we're taking the curriculum from um, the classroom, the farmer's food, and bringing it to the students' plates. And we're lucky to have a really great food service here. Um, Karen Russo is really great at collaborating and bringing in local food. We just currently worked on two forward um, purchasing contracts. The USDA requires that we do three bids and a buy. Um, on food purchases, and so we just this week sent out for beef and maple syrup. So there'll be um, Orange or Washington County beef on the menu as well as maple syrup. And the way that works is we look at a geographical area and we say we really want to be able to visit your farm. We want you to be able to come to the school. We want you to deliver on these dates at this amount, and we have all these safety regulations you have to follow. 
and then we go on the best price is how that bid is won. So we've been working on that, and we plan on diving a little bit deeper. And congratulations to the whole SU. Do you want to talk about the compost a little bit? Sure. We're so now we're um, composting. I'm Abby Gershon. I teach here at Braintree School. I'm also a parent of three kids that go to two of the schools in the district. And the composting, which we started this fall, has been highly successful at our school. Um, the really exciting part is the fifth and sixth graders have taken a lot of ownership with it. So we weigh the compost every day to track how much waste we're diverting from the landfill. Um, the kids from preschool up to sixth grade in our building compost very independently at this point. So they know if it grows, it goes right in the compost. And um, it's just been um, pretty smooth sailing. We actually requested a second five gallon bin because we were filling five, a five gallon bin um, even at our school. So under the cafeteria, this is my son and he uh, wrote something in support of Farm to School. So he's gonna stand up here and read his letter to everyone. Be kind to him. He's going to stand. <laughs> what? I said. Nope. Nice try. I am Mary Gershon. I was a, I was a third grader at Brooklyn School. I think we should put good meat in our bodies. We live in Vermont, New York, not New York City. We have farms everywhere, and our school lunch comes, far, comes from far away. We grow, small, uh, we grow a small garden in my backyard. My favorite things to eat are tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, and corn. I would like to eat vegetables that are organic. That means they don't spray chemicals. But there are kids at my school that don't have that that don't have gardens and they don't eat healthy food. So if the lunch had better meat and local vegetables, my classroom could eat better too. If you want to know what a school ice tastes like, please come tomorrow and try it. Thanks for listening, and I hope you spend more time, more money on good food. Sincerely, Marilyn. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're always working um, with the cafeteria and the students and hearing what they want. Um, I'll be sending out a survey to students to get feedback. If, are there enough options? Are there too many options? You know, what, what do they want to see? Because that's what we're, we're feeding and we want the, the food to really suit them. And there are all kinds of guidelines we have to follow, USDA regulation-wise, and what we're serving and budgets and everything. Um, but the great thing that we're doing as a collaboration, working with all of the schools at the SU, is working on an action plan and saying, what, are, what do we value as an SU um, in terms of food and farm? and how, how do we want that to look? And then here's our actions, here's our timeline, and then we're, we'll look at budgets and seeing how we can make everything work to, to meet everybody's values. Um, one way to really get everybody used to trying new foods is we do a monthly taste test where we highlight a harvest of the month from a local farm. This month is kale minestrone soup, and the kale's been coming from Pebblebrook Farm and we have a class that prepares it and then the whole school, including faculty and staff, get to sample it. They vote on it saying, yes, I liked it, oh, no, they not so much, or no, I really didn't like it. And then it shows back up on the menu later. And the idea behind that is they get this ownership of preparing it, the hands-on, they're connecting to a farmer, and they get to say whether they like it or not. And they learn this whole food etiquette of throwing out my yum, take a no thank you bite, um, say, I tried it, but I didn't like it. So we're really trying to enforce that whole culture of trying new foods, as well as getting their hands out in the gardens and on the farms. This is a picture of tallying compost, weights. Um, so what is the impact of farm to school? What's, what's the point? It's a lot of work. Um, we're looking at 30% less hunger when um, we're teaching the kids from the soil on up to their plates. They're more connected with their food. They take more ownership of eating the food. And so then we're seeing less hunger on the state wide level. And we really have. It's been really amazing. And um, a lot of times, um, as you may know, some of the only meals kids are getting are at school. You know, it's breakfast and lunch. And if there's a, a supper program, um, they're, they're not getting a lot at home. So this is really it. So we want it to be the most substantial meal. And food service does such a great job. They have, I think, one of the hardest jobs. Um, it's getting dirty. Um, so you are invited. This Wednesday at Brookfield Elementary School from 5.30 to 8, there's a free dinner, as well as a little bit of a learning session. I'll be showing this 
slideshow again, um, as well as working on our action plan at the SU level and focusing a little bit on the grant that we're going to be submitting the, um, in the beginning of November. So Brookfield, this Wednesday, you're invited. There's childcare, there's the activities for kids. Um, and that this is made possible through um, the Vermont Farm School Network. They gave us a little bit of funding to buy food and pay for some child care to bring everybody from the community together. And there'll be farmers there, and there'll be teachers and principals, so you're invited. And then one more invite. Um, Friday, October 26th, is the Randolph Harvest Dinner. And we're going to be featuring a harvest soup, a beef stew, um, Ben & Jerry's ice cream, and cider and that will be a 50 50 raffle and the funds from this help purchase the uh, the more cost of buying beef so if normally kind of the average beef that schools pay are three dollars a pound and Vermont beef is four fifty a pound this pays for that extra dollar fifty a pound um, and we're going to be working through our action plan on ways to um, purchase more Vermont food that might have a little bit of a more cost to it, but more nutritional value at across the SU, not just at the middle school, but everywhere. Um, so that'll be part of Wednesday, and then this Friday on the 23rd is a big celebration. Any questions? It's kind of a big overview of some of the projects that's been happening at the Farm to School. Are you be able to extend the composting to the other schools within the district? It's happening everywhere. That's yeah. Great. So we contracted with Grow Compost of Vermont out of um, Waterburn? Are they Waterburn? Mm -hmm. Moortown? I think it's Moortown. Yeah, and they come and pick up. And we have the big barrels at um, Randolph Elementary and High School, and we have small barrels here. And facilities has worked really great with everybody to pick up buckets here, empty them there, and wash them out and bring them back. You worked with a group of uh, high school students um, last year. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, with the best uh, best process, best people. Were. Yeah, it was it was probably at least two years of their project, and they got to see it right before they graduated. So it was really all on their part that they really did the research and proposed it. there's a strategic plan it's an, like an action plan yep okay. yep that we so we started developing that as a team at the SU level so we had representatives from every school um, last probably started last April mm -hmm. and it's always a working document so it seems like compost was is sort of a, yeah check yeah, <laughs> that, that, that was one we had to check off the plan and then um, looking at more local foods more local procurement, um, working on the bidding contracts. So we've started with that and really just trying to look at what, what can we afford with what we have. We need to have more funds to be able to purchase more foods. How are we going to do that? What's that going to look like? Is it more harvest dinners? Is it asking the, you know, the school for more money? Kind of just weighing that out right now and seeing what's feasible. Um, and what else do we have on that? Those are kind of the, the big things. And farmer connections and then curriculum integration. Remember last year, you all were down here and I didn't play you. Yeah, yeah. So I remember how excited that they were at the Yeah. Um, you guys got off that big and much more trouble, so incredible that we were going to show you the time. Yeah. And that's really my goal is to have it be the community, the SU's action plan, the SU's program, and really what it is that everybody wants and helping to connect all those dots to make it happen. Yeah. Thank you for thank taking you. the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great work. Sorry, I was late. And thanks, <laughs> Mariner, for sharing. Everybody was today. Well, we've got a quorum now, so that's good. We can proceed. Um, Lane, you're next with a budget. Yeah, we can just do it with a swap over. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
of this because we're very early in the, the budget season. Actually, it was kind of funny. I was talking to Robin the other day because most districts do start in October. Um, but you guys kind of in previous years had a ramped up system of getting things done. Um, and the reason being is because you used to be separate districts and you'd have to get the, the central kind of school board together to figure out what their overall budget was before they could figure out how to go and kind of connect with, with the other towns and, and, and pull them into kind of the money process. So we're a little bit ahead of the curve, which is kind of good. But the purpose of this presentation is kind of discuss a little bit and get an opportunity for folks to, to ask questions um, about what we're thinking about. So the parts and the pieces that we talk about are going to be things that you've heard before. Um, Kind of along through the different discussions about ends and where the school is and, and, and what you know we kind of think that the, has to happen within the district to make sure that we're meeting the ends um, but none of it is, is set in stone so this is the discussions that are happening kind of at the cabinet level um, the first one a lot of discussion has been going on around brookfield elementary um, they have had an increase this year which was a little unexpected in terms of their population they're projected to have another good one next year um, so we are looking uh, to get them an extra classroom teacher. Um, and we're going to do that to make sure that we're hitting kind of the, the, the sizes that are recommended by um, board policy. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is a math teacher um, to either be just at Brookfield or to be split between Brookfield and Braintree. Um, the math teacher would come in, would teach all the math. Um, you have a person who specializes in that content area uh, because most elementary teachers uh, in terms of their preparation, most are more on kind of the humanity side of things. Uh, most aren't as comfortable with mathematics. Um, the other reason for doing this is to try to get away a little bit from the multi-grade uh, mathematics instruction that's been happening. Still keep the, the multi-grade um, classes that people enjoy for the social aspect in, in terms of what it develops with the students. Um, it's really kind of focus in on the math because it's such a uh, sequential um, sort of subject. So multi-grade, so you have one teacher with grades two to three. And they're all in the same grade. Uh, depends on what subject. You can get away with it with like an English and a social studies if you have a two-year rotating curriculum in a class like that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of mathematics, it's a little bit more dif difficult because you got to do this before you can do this. And so for many years, they've had uh, mathematics taught to them in a multi-grade environment. So the teacher will take the time that's available, will teach one group of kids, they go off, they kind of do their, their, um, their guided practice, um, and then they'll teach the, the other group of kids. They're getting half the time. So you know, one of the things that we also did kind of do address that this year, um, the, the principals were great about it, is uh, they increased the time online with uh, 75 minutes. So what we're looking for for both years. So <laughs> At the elementary level, you can because a lot of it's project based. Lots of equal activities and things that you can do. You know, you know. So usually, you know, you start off with a direct instruction from the teacher at the elementary level, maybe 10 minutes um, tops. They go into kind of guided instruction where the teachers helping the kids with what they're doing, getting them set up, and then it's uh, kind of them on their own using what they want. So that's the, the bulk of the um, So it's kind of, kind of good. But uh, again, planning, we recognize that there's some deficiencies in the math. Um, and so as, as part of the analysis, you know, it looked like maybe that multi-grade piece um, is contributing. Instructional coaches. Uh, we have three instructional coaches in the district. These are professionals who work directly with staff. Uh, to help them improve uh, their delivery of instruction, to help them do some data analysis and go in and use what they've learned in looking at student data to adjust what they do at the classroom level. Um, for many years, as I can look back, they've always been funded under the title grant system. Uh, there are a couple of problems with that. Um, 
the first is that the title grants only like to see these types of positions for three years because at that point in time they figure either they've done their job or it's so vital to the district that the district should be paying for this under its regular budget. Um, right now these people are crucial um, and so the intent will be to move them off of title so that we don't potentially lose them in another year um, and make sure that they're under the regular budget. Of those three, one of them was already uh, pretty much moved over uh, last year. Um, so it's not, not as steep as, as it sounds. Um, again, a lot of this, I tried to put down the ends that we're meeting um, with these 1.2.1 and 1.2.2. That's the math and the English ends. And then a lot of it, it's really goal geared around improving instruction, right? Working directly with the teachers um, so that they're able to do that. So you've got math and PLA and What's the third one? Uh, we've actually got two math folks. Um, one that focuses at the elementary level, one that focuses at the, at the high school level, and then kind of a K-12 ELA. Okay, and so those people are only working with staff and curriculum, they're not direct instruction. Not direct instruction. Yeah. Math interventionists. Now we have interventionists in ELA. Um, these again, these are title funded positions. These are people that work directly with students. Um, we've had them for a number of years. Again, they've got that three year kind of timeline on them for the title grant process where they may not be able to fund them again for us next year. Um, but we've got a problem um, if we don't have, especially the math interventionists. We realize that there are problems um, in mathematics that we are working on. Um, but the problem is, is fixing what's happening requires curricular changes, which we're engaged in right now. As those curricular changes come online, we'll stop having the problems in mathematics that we are and have less of a need for the interventionist. But the problem is, is that we've got students that are in the pipeline. So if they went through grades one through six um, in previous years before the curricular work was done, they're going to have gaps in knowledge that need to be addressed. And that's what these interventions do. So we've got the curriculum work that's going on that's going to help the overall quality of math instruction across the district. Um, and then at the same time, the interventionists will come in for a couple of years to help those students that are in the pipeline get the skills they're, they're missing and get them up to speed. So in terms of the interventionists, um, in terms of math specifically, we'd like to bring those over into the regular budget. The ELA piece, the ELA is a little bit stronger. We'll still try to get them under the title. Um, but, you know, it's a 50-50 it's a shot for next year. So are you thinking that we're going to continue to need math interventionists then for longer than long term? Or is this just a short term sort of stopgap? It depends. I, it's a short term. Again, it's the kids in the pipeline. I'm estimating three to five years, depending upon how fast we can get the curriculum work done. Um, what we'll talk about a little bit later um, as we go through the budget pieces is we don't really have the structure uh, to do the curriculum work that needs to be done quick. We can get it done um, with the structure that we have, um, but it'll be kind of plodding along. It'll be very slow. And so we'll talk a little bit about this. And again, all these things are what we're discussing. It doesn't mean that, you know, Anything we set in stone. Uh, my question, though, is contractually, is that a problem? Because, you know, for, you know, to, to take on these extra teaching staff under the contract, aren't we committed to them for long term after the first two years? We're, we're, we're as committed to them now as we would be with this change because they are now under the CBA. That was part of the agreement that we worked out last year. Um, it means that they can get rift, um, just like any other teacher. You, know, you don't like, like to do that ever because of the, the impact it has on morale. Um, but the thing that they get that they didn't have before is if they do get riff, uh, they have seniority rights. So in other words, if they've been teaching with us for 10 years and another math instructor has been teaching with us for three years, they could potentially bump that person in their situation. So that would be the Okay, but it's not, you can riff them then. Yeah. And if, as if this, you know, position does not continue. Yeah, and one of the things that happened last year when we changed over um, the interventionists to being under the CBA uh, is the fact that because they're funded under title, we have to rip them at the end of the year anyway because we don't get the title funding approved until now. Literally today, about four hours ago, I got the email from 
the state that said more than consolidated federal programs while those were approved and available. So, so how many intervent tests do you think we need? Uh, we're probably looking at three to four, um, depending on how they're structured. Um, a lot of it is the, the, you know, sometimes they're shared. Um, there's such a geographic distance between the schools that you lose a lot in travel. You know? um, typically, you know, Randolph Elementary is big enough that they get one. Um, you know, you can try to share one between Braintree uh, and Brookfield, but the travel time is a half hour is 45 minutes. And it's a lot, lot, lot longer than I always, always imagined it is until I'm driving up there again and go, wow, this is really out. This is really out there. It feels a long way away. It yeah. feels kind of out there. Yeah. So um, that's part of it. The other piece, too, is um, you have to have concentrated time. You know, if you bring them in part time, um, they're not going to have as much of an impact. I mean, the, the greatest thing that improves learning for kids is uh, time on learning with a qualified. And that was one of the problems that they had uh, in the past with some of these title funded positions is that the state would come back and say, you don't have them for enough time, we're not going to approve them because they're not going to, they're not putting in enough time with the kids to have a, the impact that you expect to see. So you're better off overdoing it, getting the job done, and then getting cut away with the All right, So this is probably the biggest one on there and probably the most important. Um, the reason for this and the importance of it is it's money up front. Um, that's going to pay off big dividends later. Um, a lot of the problems that we're having in terms of the rising cost of special education, remember we had a $300,000 jump last year um, from two kids that moved into the district. Um, we are looking potentially at another 5.6% increase right now in terms of special education with the students that are moving into the district. Uh, we have one student alone um, that cost $279,000. Um, so we've got this dramatic increase in the number of students um, that need special education services because of emotional disabilities, um, because of abuse, because of trauma that has happened in the home. And when they get into the schools, uh, those behaviors uh, are not compatible. The behaviors that they've learned to kind of contend with the trauma that they're experiencing are not compatible um, with learning in school. And so they usually end up on special education plans, which are very expensive. And the model that we've had here for years and years isn't effective. Uh, it gets the kids through the school day. They have lots of paras, one-on-ones that help them redirect them during the day. But at the end of the day, the para goes home and the student goes home. And the student hasn't learned any skills of their own that is going to allow them to grow to something not need to okay. So it gets them through the day, but other, after that's done, you know, there is there is no learning um, that happens to help the kids self-regulate. So the goal would be to build a therapeutic program within the elementary school, within Randolph Elementary, where most of the students are con concentrated. Um, In-house program, um, and the goal of it would be intensive treatment of these trauma-based behaviors, so that over the course of time, these students can slowly be uh, introduced back into the, the regular curriculum, the regular classroom environment with support until after a couple of years, hopefully they've acquired enough skill that they can go right back into the regular ed environment completely and not need any services. Um, so it's a, a fairly um, comprehensive program. It would probably require two individuals, um, at the very least a counselor type, a psychologist type. Um, and then a special education teacher to, to know that program. Um, conceivably, depending upon how long the students are in the classroom, you know, if you have some that are there all day versus some that are, you know, are there for part of the day, they can have, uh, if there's two people in there, they can probably have 12 to 14 students. In there. 12 to 14 students that would cost a minimum of probably 60,000 a piece to set them up. And so that becomes a, a question for discussion. Um, we had talked in the past, um, and it's in the articles of consolidation, about the internal school choice. This would be one of the reasons to do that. Uh, this is the place where we can provide the best services for these students. We can't force a parent 
to do it, but it is an option that the special education team can consider when they're building accommodations for the child. Um, and it, it works out really well, um, the therapeutic programs, um, because when you're dealing with trauma-based students, you're dealing with students that don't have a lot of trust in adults. And so if you can get them in a, in a situation like this where they're working with the two main individuals all the time, that trust develops. Um, and then they feel a little bit more confident and a little bit more secure when they're starting their forays out into the, the, the regular classroom environment. Uh, you know, they got somebody they know if they go out in the regular classroom environment and it doesn't work um, that day, they come back in, they can debrief with these folks, they can talk about you know, why it may have fallen apart and what they can do better next time. Um, and to have those conversations requires the trust. If we're sending these students out with the expectation of getting them back, that's problematic. Because if they go out for a while, they develop trust there, and then they walk in the door two, three years later, you know, where's the trust? Uh, that things tend to fall apart in that situation. So questions on the So in terms of, you mentioned, you know, the range currently that we're spending, um, for individuals can be up to, you said, 200,000. Is that because they're being twisted out? Uh, so, or? depending upon the severity of uh, the disability, um, you know, if you have a, a student who is way over um, on the autistic spectrum, highly autistic, that's going to be a very expensive child to educate. Uh, so, it all depends on, on what the nature is. The cheapest, if we send a student out, is probably uh, EVA or our Raven program. We're talking twenty-five to twenty-seven thousand. Um, if they get a little bit more advanced. Um, you know, it's probably in the 60s, and then, you know, if they have to go down to the, the facility in White River, um, you know, you're, you're talking about these thousands. So I think it's really expensive. Um, the other problem that happens, too, with these students is if we can catch them early, we're going to do them a great service. If they've been experiencing trauma that is provoking these behaviors, and nobody does anything extensive about it until later on down the line. Sometimes they are so ingrained, it's incredible difficult um, to disappear. Uh, so the so sooner we can get them in a, in a program where you know, they've, they've got people that are local that they can trust, that they know that they can go to when uh, they go off. Um, lots of times they're just an outsider of the outside programs. So the people positions. Uh, the the teaching us uh, uh, yes but all difficult all positions are a lot of difficult right now. Um, the other thing that I, I learned um, I had an opportunity to talk with Rebecca Holcomb um, she was at the the New England Superintendents Association conference that happened a little while ago and it looks you know, a fantastic individual an absolutely fantastic lady um, that she's doing a bit of research on the trauma based behaviors. And it was funny because when I was talking with her, I said, well, I'm, I'm sure that this is across Vermont. You know, we're not just the only one seeing it. And her response was, yes, it is across Vermont, but for some reason it is concentrated right dead center in the state, which is where we're at. Um, so we do have, and she had the numbers to, to back it up, we do have a much higher prevalence um, of this year um, in the other parts of the state, which is kind of an interesting the problem, of course, is that these kids, these families move around a lot, um, you know, so there's there's not a lot of, you know, sort of consistency in, in our population. I mean, they come and go. And so we can, I mean, I, not that I'm saying that this is not a good idea. I think it is a good idea, but, you know, it's it's not going to end the problem because these, these families move a lot. There's a, we can probably do the numbers. There, there's probably about 20%. There is a core that is here. Um, the other thing that we're finding, the reason the costs keep going up is because they keep moving in. It used to be, um, until about a year or two ago, that you know, you'd know you have this balancing effect. You know, you'd have four or five move in and four or five would come out. And so things would stay pretty much steady state. Last two years, that has not been the case. They are moving in. Um, and and a, lot of, a lot of cases, um, you know, there's state placed here too, which is good, because under the reimbursement system, you know, we get reimbursed for that. But, but, yeah, it's, it's been a one-way flow for two years. Um, and again, like I said, right now we're looking, we're looking at a 5.6% increase. Um, it's actually about a 10% increase, but 5% of that we will get reimbursed after the fact. We have to pull it out of the tax base to pay it up front with the state, you know, because we're still under the old system. Um, 
Is this, Lane, in terms of your vision for this, um, is this the type of thing in, I just am wondering like, that other kids from other districts would be tuitioned in? They could. I mean, it, 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 um, that if you go that route, are we competing with Eva or you know, some of the other resources here in Central Vermont? No. Um, we could we could tuition them in uh, very much like the Raven program. Some of these students um, ideally, you know, would function very well in a, in a more academic-based uh, Raven program. Um, but the problem is, is that the age span. You know, there's uh, the younger you, the younger you are, the more important uh, being close in age is, um, and because of the the social nature. You know, two years apart is is huge socially for students. Um, he only takes students down to about seventh grade, and that seventh grader is is a was a first time. Um, I think a lot of it is, uh, you know, taking a look at taking a look at the ends and trying to find ways to to address them. Again, this would be money up front. We've got an enormous number of paras right now working as one on ones. That number has climbed because of the number of kids that have moved in the district three years ago. It was 19. It's about 25 now. We can't continue to do that. Um, we've got to address the kids. Uh, we'll always need paras. Um, but if we had a program in that was successful, you know, three, three, four years down the road, you know, we should be able to get the, those paras down, hopefully around five or six, uh, in a school this size. Uh, I've worked in schools that were districts that were three times this size where you might have three paras across the district. Uh, with an equal number of, uh, you know, still 40% body. So it all depends on the structures you've got in place. Um, information technology. Um, considering adding a, a 1.0 um, to IT, um, there are three people for the entire district. Uh, all support all the staff, all the technology, the AV, the computers, all the one-to-one. -one. Every kid has a Chromebook now. Um, and we need another person who could come in and take at least the simpler um, activities off their shoulders, so that our, our more highly trained techs can work on uh, the bigger issues that we've got. Um, the other piece that this would be wrapped into was the discussions that we had about the, the district website. Um, Cambium Group has been talking on and off about going out of business. Um, they are upping their rates. Um, a lot of the work that needs to be done uh, periodically on the website, you know, they charge us $150 an hour to do. They don't allow us to do it ourselves. Um, so there is a possibility that we can buy what's called the source codes from them. Um, use that so that we can basically own the website, make whatever changes we want, but we need a person who can do it and manage the website. Right now we're paying Cambium, and we're paying an outside person under contract to be the webmaster. It would be nice to bring that webmaster in-house, get rid of Cambium, and then use them also to take off some of the low-level tasks off the tax. Uh, so again, uh, part, part of the discussion is there. Questions? Elementary science program, um, not an expensive one, um, but potentially an important one. Um, I mean, the recognition is is that you know, preparing students for the next stage of their lives. I mean, where the money is is in STEM uh, right now, um, and we do not have a full-fledged science program across the elementary schools. There are some teachers, some elementary teachers, uh, that have a little bit of science in their background that do a little bit more. Um, but for the majority of it, this does not exist here. Um, the other piece of the science isn't just preparing them for STEM, but it also allows the idea of practice of these transferable skills, right? You're learning how to, how to read and write. Um, you're learning your mathematical skills. Um, science gives you an opportunity to try those skills out in a new discipline. Um, so they learn that, hey, what I'm learning in, in math and English translates really well. So that would be a curriculum for focus on, is that elementary? Elementary that level. So okay. ele elementary folks, because they mm -hmm. teach so many different classes during the day, um, it's a little bit different than the high school level. High school folks can usually, they'll develop their own curriculum, their own lessons. In a lot of cases, the elementary folks don't have the time to do that even if they wanted to. So usually you go out, you research, and, and you buy a program that the picture ends, in this case, our ends, mm -hmm. uh, to get things done. That kind of guides them along, does a lot of the them. Uh, 
expanded program offerings um, to make sure that we're hitting uh, some of the board's ends. Uh, we're in discussions right now um, about a life skills program. Um, started that with the cabinet about a week ago. Um, we're looking at a digital, the creation of a digital literacy program, and then it's also a pre-tech program. The pre-tech program is going to be an something that we're going to have to do for, for grades at least five on, but it would be nice to do it across all grades. Um, questions on that? What those programs look like, we don't know. Um, part of the discussion, um, I'm talking with the cabinet, they're supposed to be rolling those conversations down to their faculty. Um, and in the case of the life skills program, out to the community and out to the students and then washing it back up so that we've got all the data collected in one spot to try to build it. Um, you know, the question is, is, you know, this life skills, does that become, you know, two or three classes across the grades or is it a program that's integrated into each grade level into certain classes? So these are kind of discussions that are you saying the pre-tech program is going to be mandated statewide? Mm -hmm. State's got a, got a mandate out there. Um, Jason, Jason's been really good. He's been, been kind of plugging away on it. But uh, we're talking about what form it will take. Um, what's nice is you know we'd like to get students connected with it a little bit earlier. You know, get the kids from the elementary school come up. So what we're thinking is because we've got some space in the classroom, he doesn't have any space that's left in the, the tech center. Um, is uh, taking one of those classroom spaces and using it that thing. And then coordinating with the elementary schools to bring the kids to come up and work on some projects there that support them on what they're doing in their elementary classes. There's a lot, a lot of work that needs to be done to do it develop, but it's, it's on the books, it's kind of moving forward. The uh, last piece, this is the one that will never fly, but it would be a, a pie, pie in the sky sort of ideal as a curriculum talk about weakness in curriculum and we talk about the fact that when you try to address something usually the first thing you do is you fix the structure. If you don't have the structure, no matter what you build, it's just going to fall to the ground. So you've got to have the structure to support the work you're doing. Um, it would be nice to have a, a K-12 curriculum director, somebody who can see everything from top to bottom, make sure that everything dovetails together nicely that supports um, the students as they move up through each class from grade to grade, making sure that the curriculum is looping around the way that it's supposed to. Um, they would also manage the title funds um, and also be the person who oversees kind of the data collection um, and rolls that out as those discussions with the faculty and uses that the, those discussions to kind of judge on using the instructional practice. Um, this is a standard position in every district, even ones that are smaller than ours. We seem to be missing two vital people. We're missing an HR sort of person, and we're missing the uh, curriculum director. So what ends up happening is those two positions um, are kind of spread out amongst the people in the central office, which is fine. But that's what I meant when I said it'll slow down the curriculum work. I can do it. It's just going to happen like slow with, with, with all the other um, I, I think it's something that we talked about when we talked about suggested hiring the second principal yeah. calling that yep. person the curriculum director for a high school level mm -hmm. and so it's that's still happening okay yes yeah. and so that's the work that's going on with it yeah. okay but you want someone to take on the k k8 k6 i, I want i want somebody to so I want okay. somebody to oversee the whole curriculum K to 12 process and the title grant program. That's typically what these these people do, because if we get some of the the personnel moved on to the regular budget where they should be, that's going to open up that four hundred and eighty thousand dollars that we get uh, from the government each year to build programs with and to do the actual curriculum work as opposed to spending it on personnel we should be paying for ourselves. Um, that person, because they have that K to 12 view and it's all they do, um, will be able to tailor those grants to fully support um, everything that's happening across the district. Um, we do a pretty good job right now, um, but it could, could be much better. You know, we're, we're limited by the, by, by the manpower and the hours of the day to, to really ta tailor this technique. And then the last piece, which we talked a little bit about last year, this one doesn't really cost anything. It's just another bucket to put surplus funds in when we have them. Um, but I'm really, really, really nervous about the upcoming changes um, for the special education funding in the state. 
Um, right now, as, as you know, we're under a reimbursement system. If I have somebody move into the district in the middle of a year, yes, I have to pay for the services, but I know at the end of the year the state is going to pay me back for a significant portion of that. But that will not happen after these changes go into effect in 2020. Um, what will happen is they'll look at the total number of students, regular ed students, um, in your school, and they'll give you a block sum of money uh, at the beginning of the year based upon your student population. That's all you get. So if I have a kid that moves in halfway through the year that's costing two hundred and seventy-nine thousand, we're got problems there uh, because we've got to figure out where that that money is going to come from, and it takes away the predictability. You can't predict these folks anyway, um, but you certainly there's no no way to predict what your financial needs are without the block grant system. So it would be nice to get a, a bucket that's out there, you know, that we keep 100,000 or 200,000 and we can build it up over the course of time. So that if we get that kid that moves in in the middle of the year, it's not going to decimate the rest of the district's budget to have to pay for it. Uh, questions, yeah? I was trying to understand that. So You're thinking it looked like <laughs> Well, I am, sorry. So when you say a surplus account, do you mean like... Like the um, facilities. And, like the facilities. Yeah, you would have to approve so, the release of the money once it's in there. Yeah, okay. And, and we, that's, did, that's, we did check it out, and they said it's legal. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Is that, so that is illegal? Did, we actually did went to the AOE mm -hmm. business person uh, to check it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Robin Stavetti, the captain of the house. And so that bucket would be available yeah. to help offset any additional yep. costs. Yep. I mean, we still do what we can with the block grant you know, that comes in, and, and hopefully. Because we don't even know at this point in time how much that block grant is going to be for people. Uh, so we can't even predict anything at this point in time, uh, you know, potentially what the funding level is going to be. But we, st we still have to do our planning as best we can, but this is in that case of, yeah, we just had two kids move in, 300,000. We've got to cover it. We've got to cover it now. And when, when does this new special education format of budget of I believe, again. believe 2020, um, and this is a transition. I mean 2019-21, so this next fall or the following? The following, yeah. but there's a slow transition, a slow migration. To it. <coughs> and that's not just proposed, but that's... Oh, that's law as of last that's year. That's been okay. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a budget tax that's, 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 that's not, not that much money. It's supposed to last. So that's your budget per preview, and I can't remember what is our parameters in terms of when do we start kind of getting a sense as to. So things should be, you got to be ready for the vote in March. Yeah. Um, you have to have time for us to do our own budget presentation uh, to the community that I believe was February last year. Things should be fairly finalized January. The, um, what's going on now in terms of the other parts of the process is the, uh, the principals and Steve Kenny, the special education director, going in to meet with Robin and you know, giving, giving, giving her the pie in the eye to figure out what it's all going to cost. And then we're going to sit down and look at the ends, compare and say, OK, this is, this is reasonable. Uh, these are things that we're going to have to cut because it'll never fall. Uh, but it's, good. it's a good uh, exercise for them to go through, because uh, typically with budgets, uh, as an administrator, what you do is you ask for what you need to achieve the mission. Because that way people know what the ex expectation is. And if we're really going to do this, this is what we need to pull it off. doesn't mean we're going to get it, but at least that communication is in the back of people's minds. So I found that usually if you harp on the same thing for two or three years, eventually people get sick of it. And people like it. <laughs> you guys would have to approve the budget January, the okay. January meeting, in order to hit the warning time and Town reports. Yeah, yeah. Usually by December we have a fairly you yeah. Good yeah. Idea and you will. Of what the yeah. budget's going to look like. So, Lane, are, are you uh, so all these new positions? Are, are you proposing to uh, cut other positions in order to make the budget relatively flat, or are you proposing that in addition to what we usually do, we're going to have all these additional, say, we're uh, a rather increase? Um, it would be nice to just increase it, but. To do due diligence, I have pulled all the enrollment numbers. Um, I just got them about two days ago. So the next meeting that we have, it might be appropriate for me to show you what the enrollments are and have that discussion publicly um, and just see what it shows us. Um, I mean, the enrollments are up at every every school um, based upon what I've seen. So 
and it would be a good discussion. We'll get some three-year trends in there and we'll take a look at it. So, yeah. That sounds good. And so, just, I mean, I know we'll talk more about it later, but I guess the question is still brewing my mind around the title yeah. grants and the title money. Is that sort of um, something that you, as you work through the budget, have other plans for? Or is that, I mean, if, if and start thinking about the intervention positions, if those are moving over to base or regular funding, <coughs> I mean, I, I assume that we will still continue to get title money. Yeah, so it's a. And it's, so that'll be part of your budget. It's it's kind of funny. Um, the government determines how much you get. It's always it's like a block grant. So we always get our four hundred and eighty thousand or whatever it is, four fifty somewhere in there, um, every year. This whole grant application process that we go through that takes a couple of months um, is just basically confirming for the government how we're going to spend it so that they can say, yes, this is within our guidelines or no, this is not. But that money comes every year regardless. Mm -hmm. And so that money, would, would that money, would you propose that that money still be planned to use for their salaries? Or would you then use, use it to build some of the programmatic needs that okay. they have? You might so even, can't on that. Might even be able to use it for three years for you know, a K K twelve curriculum. Now, what's nice, what's nice about that is if we had the position for three years, we could probably get ninety percent in place what we need to get in place. And once that work is done, then a, a more skeleton crew can, can maintain it and do the adjustments for three years. Just for starting from scratch. I mean, that's what makes it a little bit more difficult. So, good questions. Any other questions from the board? Okay, so we have um, scheduled an, another second public um, discussion opportunity. So if any of you here um, from the community want to ask a question or um, reflect on something that we just heard, uh, feel free. Hi. Hey. I'm David. Uh -huh. <clears throat> it was nice to hear some of the math interventions positions when I look at the scores and how they're lacking like against the end so thank you for for putting that on the budget um, I was just a question for you Lane is there any consideration for a um, resource officer I know there was some a question of what, what would happen with the Randolph police and whether they could be responsive we still they have not made their decision yet on what they're doing um, so it would hinge on that I mean we do have the security upgrades I do have a uh, co-facilities director who is a police officer um, who has access to act in that role should there be an emergency and I'm not going to go into more detail on that. Um, so that we do have. Uh, but a lot of it's going to come down to um, what ends up happening at the, the town level in terms of deciding, you know, are they going to have a police force or are they not? Are they going to not have a police force but contract out to, to Orange County? Um, and keep them there. Um, but I believe I had the date in my head. I think it's it's in November. I think it's early November that they're they're having that final meeting and that final determination. It's a good question. Any other public comment? Okay. Um, next on the agenda is um, to determine the board governance budget. Um, generally, we have set for ongoing training for ourselves a, a, a at least adequate budget. Um, previous years we put in money for a keynote speaker. Um, we decided, uh, Paul, Lane, and I really, that that's not an appropriate place to put that funding. Um, it just really, you know, it's it's not really for governance. Um, it really is has a has a different goal. Um, so if the schools do feel like they, they would like to um, fund a keynote speaker for the community. That should be that month. That money should have a different earmark. Really, um, in the board governance budget, uh, we think, um, Vice Chair and myself, we think it's appropriate to have another um, opportunity to uh, be trained by Val Gardner. Um, we can determine, you know, what exactly we want that training to focus on. But perhaps, you know, either sooner, you know, November, or perhaps when we get our new board members, you know, maybe in January or something like that, we have another um, evening um, scheduled for, for ongoing training. But other than that, um, the new board members, you know, we do have monies for you guys to get um, additional policy governance training. Um, and besides that, um, perhaps some written materials. In, um, Which we already 
ordered. Yeah, Linda, Linda's already in. Mm -hmm. But so yes, the, the board governance budget is going to be considerably less than in the last few years because we're taking that ten thousand dollar keynote speaker um, chunk out. Is there? Do we actually need to vote on on what we? I would want. I would make a motion and vote on what I'm putting in the budget for you. Okay. And I think that would be appropriate. What is in the budget? So. Um, Currently this year, because it was we, we mimicked what was done the year before, it's twenty thousand. Um, I think Val Gardner, not Gar oh, we, we're t you're talking Val. Um, yeah. I was thinking um, Miriam. Mm -hmm. Miriam was forty seven hundred to come out and do the training. Um, Val is, is probably a quarter of that. Yeah. Um, just just for comparison. Mm -hmm. And I think I mean, we had her in July, so that would be this current budget. We propose to have her a second time this year. But, yeah. That, and you, can't, you, that can't touch what Mary covered. Yeah, and you and you've, you've you've got the money for it. And Miriam ended up not being all that expensive anyway because we had invited the other towns and it pretty much covered um, everything except for like three hundred and fifty per person for our our staff. The, the only thing that I was thinking is you know given the turnover in the board and new board members coming on that um, yeah, you true. know having Miriam come back maybe not until. Mm -hmm. Early spring, you know, after we've gone through the next election, so that you know it sort of allows the next uh, group of board members to kind of all hit the ground. Yeah, that's um, a good idea. Mm -hmm. It would be worth considering. Mm -hmm. Miriam, though, did it, did a training for what, forty people or something like that. Um, that, that was the one a couple of years or a year ago. It was last was fall. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, she, um, the, the other people that are, other group um, is uh, Rutland South. Um, they have some boards that are policy governance and some that are not. So as they're consolidating, they're trying to shift them all over. So they have a dramatic interest in, in participating with us or us with them if they bring around. So that, that's yeah. another op you know, option. We could go down there for a, if they get some you know, national all right, so how do we want to proceed? Do you have a, um, a suggested? I, th I or think do we want to vote on this when we propose the budget. Uh, either either or, or, just if you guys are comfortable in giving me you know, an idea of, of a number to put in. I think 10 is probably more than enough. Um, and it sounded like the reason um, in our discussion that you headed up around 20 was that that was meant for a one time speaker because of the opioid crisis at the time. Mm -hmm. So if 10 is enough, and then we can adjust it from there if it ends up not being. Um, I probably would. I'd like to make the motion of setting the uh, policy governance budget to ten uh, thousand ten thousand dollars. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay. Thank you. So that'll go in. Thank you. All right, next is an update on CBA negotiations. Is this something that can um, happen outside of the executive session? Oh, yeah. So this is basically because we haven't met yet, and so nothing's been determined. Um, the f date of the first meeting is October 30th at 4 p.m. in the Randolph Elementary Library. Um, Chris Armstrong is the chief negotiator um, for the union. And then um, I have reached out to Pietro um, to ask him if he could be here a little early um, prior to that first meeting just so that the negotiating committee can kind of get their heads wrapped around uh, the whole process. Um, that first meeting is just establishing ground rules. Um, so it should be simple. The only other piece to add to this, and this is um, probably discussion uh, that the board should have um, at some point in time, is that the Paras contract, the support staff contract, is also up for negotiation. Um, they had put in a letter um, last week, I believe it was last Friday uh, or so, um, asking to start that process. Um, they were wondering and hoping that they could sit through the same process with the CBA folks. In other words, have both at the table during the negotiations. Um, I asked Pietro what his advice was. He's off in, in Greece. He should be back. Um, and should hear from him. So was, my question was, I saw the email. Of, yeah. Were they simply wanting to be in that first meeting where we're laying down the ground rules, or were they talking about right the through whole, the whole process? Yeah. 
I mean, they, they're, they're, they're represented by the same state group. They're um, represented by the same group, however, their contracts are significantly, significantly different. different. Yeah. And so with, they're not going to be trying to say we're going to propose one, it would be two contracts still, but during the same period? Yeah. The other thing that we could go back and, and tell them is, yeah, we'll do it on the same days because that'll save everybody right. travel. Um, but we do They're so separate. long with this one, and then we'll pick, we'll do you, you know, for the hour afterwards. Work with the right. hour after that might be more appropriate. Yeah. It just seems to me that it'd be really complicated yep. to be doing in the same meeting two contracts because these usually take months to do uh, yeah. individually. And so I'm wondering together how are we going to? I'm not even sure how we would be able to do that. Where, yeah. Or sitting looking at two contracts. Oh, I'm not recommending it. Yeah. I'm just passing on that. It just seems odd to me. Yeah. The same day makes absolute sense. The, yeah. the, the first meeting, same ground rules for both groups, it seems, makes yeah. absolute sense. But after the ground rules, it seems to me that it's just they are so significantly different yeah. that it would, be, it would be difficult. But what might make sense is um, to save everybody time and money. Is like I said, is you know there will yeah. be longer sessions, but you know right. we More work on the CBA that. for the hour, hour and a half, two hours, whatever, then an hour, hour and a half of uh, the support staff. Yeah. Um, and that way, you know, saves you know the the lawyers making their trips and, yeah. and whatnot multiple times. That makes a lot of sense. So if you guys are comfortable with that, I'm happy to go back and. <coughs> All right. Um, so Paul typed up a another version, a new version. Um, Art was the Oracle, which is in a separate paper here. Paul, you want to present this? Oh uh, yeah. Sure. So I went through our goals we had discussed in our last meeting that, that they no longer were um, sufficient just because a lot of them had already been met and so in the status they all said met and so we weren't really discussing anything we were going to be doing in the future. And so I came up with three goals that I thought I heard us um, talking about. The one thing I was conflicted on was do we want to add in goals that we normally have on a rotating basis that every year we do? and just as like a checklist. So an example would be um, the, the board governance budget. Do we add small things in there like that we know every year during this certain month we have to do this just so we don't miss anything? Or do we just want these kind of bigger things? For example, the board will ensure the ends are relevant reflecting the values of the community and future oriented. Do we want to leave that as uh, the, the kind of goals we want to set? and just realized that Linda keeps a pretty good list that the um, chair and vice chair see on a regular that basis. Template there. Right. Um, but you guys actually help me fix up. Right. So do we want to add something like that to the goals? But these are the goals. Um, basically, the first goal, board will ensure the ends are relevant. The second goal, board will communicate with its constituents. And then the third is develop the board. And so, um, the the first two goals are basically the two things that I still I think that we need to, we have decided that need the most work, that, that um, ensuring that we're relevant and reflecting the values of the community and future oriented, not worrying about today but tomorrow. Um, those are the things that we need to stay up on in order to continue doing that. That's not something that's one and done. That's something that has to be repeated every so many years. I took a stab and said. A couple years, not to one year, but four years. So every four years, reevaluate, and then that way, because Lane can't change his entire whatever the benchmarks are, he can't change them every year because if it's a moving target, he never reaches it. And so, we I thought four years is a good time. I, I don't know if you want to go less, three years, two years, Lane. I don't know what your recommendation is for a time period, but it needs to be future, not this year. So yeah. if we change it at the beginning of the year, we can't evaluate anything and then change it for the next year just because nothing's done properly. Yeah, it takes three years to establish a trend. That's the, the, the normal thing. So if we have a trend in three years, the fourth year we're evaluating it and then making the new recommendations, I guess, is so we could probably hash out the actual um, schedule of what we should be looking at trend-wise and, and whatnot. Yeah, especially so where the, da the data should be pretty telling. You're going to get jumps up and down, but again, the three year trend lines are usually what I use. Uh, that, that's kind of the standard in business. Yeah. Right. So I don't know if we want to say this next next year we want, so 2019, or if we want to attempt in the next couple of meetings to start looking at that, but the review of it 
Um, do we say that what we have now is good to go, or do we want to start the process of um, looking at what we have currently on record and then, you know, push forward with uh, reevaluating and, and adding the starting the next review process? I, I don't know. I didn't have an answer for that, but you know, select it as an action step, set date for the next review. Do we want to do that soon, later, a couple years? Year? I, I mean, feel like we just did it. Yeah, and I really feel like, especially with the change in the report cards and right. there's a lot um, of change. Yeah, and and board change. That's yeah, that's I why the only, that, the only thing that's that's the only reason I would think about redoing it sooner than later is because the composition of the board has changed significantly. It has, and yet we've asked so many changes changes for yeah. the administration. You know like the report cards and yep. that are so intimately tied with um, our board ends that it right. doesn't seem quite fair, fair <laughs> to, yeah. to, to even start to you know monkey with them at all at least at this point right. you know so I, I don't know I would I would propose waiting yeah I think I think four years is a great um, sort of right. you know a period of time we, I don't think we can wait four years to no. begin that but no. I don't know, what do you guys think? What, what do you think is a realistic time frame to begin to evaluate our ends? I was gonna say, I think, um, I don't know about the evaluation piece, but I think that collection of information and you know, sort of the, the input gathering piece, yeah. I feel like that's an ongoing yeah, process, and I, I would hate to say to ourselves that you know we're gonna stop that process um, in the name of not wanting to make any big changes you know, in the foreseeable future. Um, so I think I, I would almost recommend that as a board that we focus on that now mm -hmm. and because I think that'll tell us. I think it's there's always a nice opportunity, I think, to just check the pulse and make sure that you know we're not way off base in terms of the end or that there's not a huge gaping hole. Uh -huh. so, some, well, sometimes the, the data, I mean, this is what we do with, uh, like with the principals and when, when I was overseeing the, the teachers directly, is, you know, you set the goals. And, and, and you put some, you know, pretty stringent timelines on it, and you know what standard you expect them to achieve on that. Doesn't mean you they, they they always achieve it. And there's a good discussion that comes up when they didn't, because maybe we misinterpreted what the actual solution should have been. Uh, maybe uh, given the circumstances and the limiting factors, you know, within the community and within our resources, maybe the standard was too high. But that's a valuable discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's you know. Don't mm -hmm. some thoughts out there. Yeah. So, when you think about doing the evaluative <coughs> process, how would you envision going about that? Well, I wasn't on the board when that happened last time, so I guess I, I would be curious to know more about what that process looked like, and I think as a board, it would be valuable to talk more about what that process would entail. Um, I mean, I think so. I, you know, I, but I do think I, I would say the second bench, benchmark here, Paul, that you identified, which is mm -hmm. meeting with leaders in education and employment sectors. Mm -hmm. I would see that as something that. I think as a board, it would be great to see us try to implement that over the next year, mm -hmm. and yeah, then sort of use that as a opportunity to kind of mm -hmm. continue along our path, and, but not commit to a full evaluation process. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's what I would envision. And I think for that one, the action steps uh, we need to develop more for that is, for example, a we got to identify who they are that mm -hmm. we want to be meeting with, but b how do we do it. Are, are we talking about, are we asking people to come here to our board meetings in order to discuss it, or are we talking about board members are simply going to go meet with these people as individuals, gather intelligence, and bring it back to these meetings, and then say, here's what I've learned from this, and you say, this is what I've learned from this. Mm -hmm. In each meeting, we just keep you know, talking about trends where we're hearing from, from these different some of, some of the, um, you know, the funding that you've got, uh, the the uh, board government species uh, for those discussions. Right. Bring in a trained facilitator, uh, yeah. have them go through a protocol, because um, it usually it, it speeds up it speeds up the process. It gets you to the information you're looking for a little bit quicker, mm -hmm. um, and you could probably have you know multiple people or multiple groups at the same time. All the time. I think you've got to get really good to get these skills really good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just have some thoughts on these. I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I do have to say, you know, I appreciate like the farm to school discussion tonight. I appreciate kind of these sort of more informal opportunities to um, just kind of hear 
feedback of either what's going on within the district or also you know sort of touching base with some of the key educational or employment sectors leaders um, in our community. So you know I think um, I, and I don't know how receptive they would be. I mean, recognizing everybody's schedule is very busy and, and it may be too much of an ask, but um, you know if there was an opportunity maybe over the next year to identify a handful of individuals to ask to come to the board meeting, mm -hmm. I think. I think if we're not like board members, but I think for the community, I think it could be a really interesting opportunity for them to share back out. So one that we, we currently have coming on regular mm -hmm. is the political leaders. We, we get our legislature to come up with yeah. that, right? And they, they always come. And so that was one I left out of the actual benchmark or action step with. Because, again, I thought to myself, is that a checklist thing? Because we do that every year. Or do we need to make that a goal to do that? And so I left that out. but. The, the, those guys, that's what I was envisioning when I put that as a benchmark kind of, it's something like that where we're having a reoccurring date mm -hmm. for dates that these certain people are coming that, that we have identified, whoever they may be. You actually have them going on right now. Um, we're going to talk a little bit in the incidental zone on um, kind of the solar projects in the town. Right. But you've got the R3 group, um, which is working, which is pulling together and has pulled together the leaders. Um, from the surrounding towns, mm -hmm. and they kind of meet regularly. And right. they get those guys to come and have a conversation. Um, the other possibility is I'm sure that Vermont Tech um, right. goes off to a summit um, where they pull in you know, the business leaders to see what the trends are so that they can adapt to the mm -hmm. um, So it's, it's possibly the top of the the president of the and just say, hey, this is part of what we have. So that you got them all together, and you're going to have them all day, can we steal them for? And then the next one uh, we we'll communicate with its constituents. It's, a, it's more about how we um, need to. We, we have identified we need to work on this, but uh, these are just some activities and, and what those might look like for benchmarks and action steps that uh, I've identified. I don't know why this one box is <laughs> off. When I look at a computer, it wasn't cut off, but uh, I don't know why I printed that way. Yeah, it does. Um, um, so I'm not sure what the state is. I'm sure public announcements are clear about what ends and other performance outcomes will be discussed in board meetings. So that gets to what Kate was saying of the, you know, kind of the simplified, this is what we're going to be talking about announcement instead of the legal announcement. Mm -hmm. and, and so that people can understand, like, for example, today it would say preliminary discussion of budget instead of the legal um, in the of this meeting and here's our agenda, which somebody looks at this agenda and they might be overwhelmed with, but if we just said, here's the agenda and what's important to note is determining board, or uh, we're gonna be discussing the budget preview. That's probably the most important thing that you're gonna see on there. Mm -hmm. And that might just catch people and they go, oh, mm -hmm. I, I care about that, I want, really wanna go listen to that. You mean having that right on the warning when you warn it and the or we could send. We've got the new. We've got the new email system. Right. It's easy enough to send out, yeah. and we'll talk on the incidentals about the fact we're putting work with Ben to get the packets put up on the the website. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be not hard to make that email that goes out to parents as just a blurb in Preview. the Herald Preview. that yeah. goes out right. on the Thursday before our meeting. It just says, at this next um, board meeting, being held in Braintree at 6.30, we will be, Discussing you know, have a, yeah. a presentation yeah. by the Farm to School coordinator and, a, a, you know, a, a discussion about um, the upcoming <coughs> budget. Sorry. Maybe anything that has the public discussion thing underneath or, it you know, would just be some, yeah. worth some mentioning. Sort of main, yeah. Yeah, 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 you know. So especially stuff that's of interest to the community, right? Because there, there's the farm to school was is awesome that when they came because there's mm -hmm. so much that goes on that people mm -hmm. don't know about, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but I think just highlighting sort of what may be of interest to people mm -hmm. um, outside of our parents, um, because there there might be community interest in some of those things. It could be the focus of the meeting whole yeah. thing up there. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. And I don't think it would be have to be long I can or complicated. Shoot a, I can shoot a paragraph narrative out prior to each meeting. That's that's easy enough. I should be doing it anyway now that, that we're, would be great. we're talking about it. Yeah. Okay. It's a good idea. The the, mm -hmm. the rest of these are, are pretty much what we're already we've we've talked about several times and I think we already kind of do. Um, it's just 
<laughs> some of the actions that need to be taken, I think, is to make sure we're doing it and making sure that it continues to be done. For example, we added in the public discussion after something that we thought people might want to discuss, like the budget. And just these are small steps we've started to take, and I, I think we need to leave that in as a goal to ensure we're, we're doing that. We're following through with something we've identified that may help. Um, the superintendent's already changed the way he's doing his presentations, and so I, I think what we could do is come up with, I, I know Linda has the checklist, but perhaps we publish this checklist uh, so we know which year, or in the given year, which months it's the right? superintendent's going to be yeah. doing mm -hmm. the data. So we know last month that he presented some data. We know in a couple months he's going to be presenting more data, but just maybe we publish that schedule yep. yeah, since we know what it is. That kind of thing. It's just a smaller mm -hmm. things, just so <clears throat> if somebody does go looking, it's there, and, and they don't go, oh, I, I missed yep. it. It was mm -hmm. last week. So schedule of topics. Be good. And then that last one, the board will direct the superintendent prepare community-friendly data summary. So this happens every year. He writes a, or I, I know it technically it's us, but you, you write the data that goes into that packet that we send out for uh, town, town meeting, meeting. day. That's one of those, I didn't know if I, we really needed to include it or not. It's a checklist item, but it is something that we have to do. And be, do. Be if, it, if it's too dense. Right. I don't I think it is. Know. No, usually Ben, I usually, pretty well. ben, ben I work with on it because he's the communications guy, so right. he smooths it out pretty well. Yeah, it so. usually breathes well. And then the last, the board government, or board development stuff. So new board members complete a, uh, orientation. Um, that was, I, I think you completed the packet. I, I, I think you, you did. was supposed to have, of, um, Brooke was supposed to be in charge of that and I don't think oh, that happened. Oh, okay. So we're, we're, that's still in, that, it still says it's in process and so we'll, we'll continue working on that. And then, so we have one right here. And so we, this is, we need something in addition to it. Is that, is that what it is or? Um, and then we've we got the two have, books that Linda Yeah, ordered. I don't know whether, Melody and Rachel, did you get the board member um, books from Linda about mm, the um, policy governance? I don't know. We didn't, I didn't wasn't here last meeting. No, they I came don't think we did. Meeting, we, do, so. we do have them, so yeah. we, can, we can get them in I got a whole lot of information from the Montpelier training that we did. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. But we've got the round one of the Miriam, or the Carver yeah, method, which is good. Booklet. And then mm -hmm. the um, Robert's Robert Rules, Rules, the short, short oh, version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that we'll make sure we get those in your hands. Okay. Yeah, those came in two weeks ago. Um, they came pretty. I think quick. before the last meeting. I think it was meeting, before the last meeting. But I wasn't. Here. Then uh, monitoring the board performance. We, I believe we we said Val Gardner had a, a new checklist that she had brought up in our meeting back in <laughs> yep. that July or I don't recall. <laughs> and so we're still just waiting on that. I, I assume yeah. I haven't heard. I, I apologize. I I just haven't had a check, yeah. chance to circle back with her. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean. So, that's an in-process thing, and then governance training is always in process. We always need to be working on that. And so I don't know. If, I know we talked about do we want to do it every meeting or do we want to do it a couple meetings? And so I yeah. think um, we just got to determine what that frequency is and, and go with it, whatever that is. We're doing it tonight. Right. As I was say, I would suggest, I mean, you know, and I imagine that she can share resources with us, but I guess I think there is an opportunity, especially if we're looking at bringing her in right. back in for another training, you know, that may be not, I obviously wouldn't be a full focus, but that may be a part of, right. you know, the time that we use with her, I think is to develop something um, <coughs> that meets our needs yeah. a little bit better. Um, Are there any other suggestions for changes or additions? Um, to these proposed goals. This is great. Thank you for pulling this together. And you kept it to a research is if it's more than six, it's we'll get done. Yeah, we'll get done. Did I, did I, it's awesome. Try to narrow it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for doing that. All right. Um, Next is discussion and possible approval of um, an unpaid sabbatical. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of our packet. Um, it is a letter from Norma Pelos, who is a Spanish teacher at the high school. Um, I don't know if you guys got time to already read through it. Um, so she's looking at 
uh, second semester of next year, 2019-2020. So plenty, plenty of heads up. Um, I did get a chance to speak a, a couple of times with um, both Katie and Elijah. They're very supportive of it. So my recommendation is, is that it's approved. It's something that we offer. Yep. As part of their contract, this is an unpaid leave. Um, and she's the only one, um, and she met the deadlines. So, Is there someone to cover? For the, I mean, that, that'll be the, the more difficult piece, but they'll be able to, they'll be able to manage it, okay. yeah, especially with the time frame that we've got. Yeah. So do I have a motion to um, approve um, the request by Ms. Tallows? Motion to approve. Mm -hmm. Second? Sure, I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That is approved. Um, next, review and discuss ENDS monitoring reports. Oh, let me get this. So this is, a, we had a discussion about it, uh, was it for, yeah, it was the last board meeting, mm -hmm. um, on the critical thinking piece. So this is the updated version. And I'm assuming that you guys have to review and approve the ends. Is like it different did. than the ones already in the packet? The, so we did, we did do a change, and that's, yeah, it is a little different. Okay. Um, you're not going to see it unless I point it out to you. Um, we had talked about the critical thinking, which is about the third page in. Uh, yep, third page in. Um, yes. there were, we had some discussion about, you know, oh, yeah, the, the students, everyone yep. exceeding, yep. you know, across all five measures. I brought it back, talked with the board um, for a while, and they said, you know what, we do want the students to revise and improve. I mean, that's part of the adaptability piece, part of what we're striving for. So how about we make it so of the five possible components that they could be exceeds on that we strive to get, you know, half of them to at least hit exceeds on one. So they felt that was a more appropriate measure. And it still preserved that piece, I think, that the board had spoken of, of you know, making sure that if your exceeds across the board and you get that, that, that uh, notoriety in the press, mm -hmm. um, that it still remains something special. Um, mm -hmm. So that was the adjustment that was made there. Are we already there? Don't they already do that? They, they all have to pass it, but they all don't have to mm -hmm. get exceeds. Oh, in terms of yes, we've already we're already in compliance with that yeah. this year, but it's we haven't been every year. Oh, okay. Um, and you it's can fifty percent on the on, on the product. Line. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a a reasonable. Yep. Yeah. And then what what we do with these two is what I'll do is if it looks like it's too easy, you know, we can always come back and discuss. Hey, is it mm -hmm. is the standard too low? That's mm -hmm. part of that the conversation. Yeah. Is this the only change to that? Yep. Yeah. Everything everything else re re remain the same. Um, in terms of the report, but I wanted to take into account what the board was discussing. So do we need to approve this now? Um, it wasn't approved last time. It was just a review. Um, okay. So this would be, you know, approved to accept. Okay. So do I have a motion to approve to accept the EL, e, um, ENDS monitoring report um, in September? Motion to approve and accept the EL from September. Second? I'll second all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. So that's um, that monitoring report approved. So these next EL reports, Lane, we will review today, but then approve next time. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, that way it okay. gives an opportunity for discussion. And if there are further things that the board would like to see um, or add, or then it gives us time to do then that. Then we'll see them again next, next month to approve them. Yeah. OK. Great. So do you want to talk about EL 2.1 at all? Usually these, um, I usually just say what they are and whether, whether or not, you know, they were found to be in compliance. So 2.1 was treat, treatment of students, parents, guardians in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was in, in compliance across the board. Um, and so open it up to questions if there are. I have my copy of it. These are a little easier to write because these ones were ones that I had started to adjust last year. Um, so a little quicker to get them out. Are there any changes in um, the way treatment of, of students, parents, guardians, or community is, is being done? Uh, nope. Um, let me see. The big one was uh, the security work. So provision three, um, allow staff to be unprepared um, to deal with emergencies. 
Oops, I'm, I'm on 2.2. Sorry about that. 2.1 was was uh, was pretty good. I showed some different data in there on this part of the discussion to show that it was in compliance, but. So if everyone would make sure to read this um, over the next couple of weeks so that we can approve it next time, um, that would be helpful mm -hmm. since um, we're not going to the office to uh, review them uh, one by one or two by two. And the treatment of staff, I know that I asked, you know, the staff surveys I was interested in seeing um, because we haven't seen them in Several years. Then I, I talked with Tina. What she's looking for is she's looking for the data um, so that we can get a trend line set. Um, it looks like it's been about four to five years mm -hmm. um, since it's been done. Mm -hmm. um, in the the big, long, overly long superintendent's report, um, the state of Vermont, um, as part of meeting its federal requirements, is developing a school climate survey that will be administered in the spring. To staff members this or to students? Staff and students. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be the more useful one. So what I was hoping to do was to use the trend from the old one to see how well it matched up with what the state comes up with. Um, but I can give you kind of an overview. They don't have all the questions and whatnot. So are you proposing to just simply move the acceptance of this until after then? No. Okay. No. No. Um, I've, I've also got the uh, the safety survey that I put together last year that went out. I can mm -hmm. send you guys if you wanted. It's about 180 questions long. Safety. The, yeah, we put together a, a survey. Um, I went out kind of the research base uh, to figure out some of the best questions to ask. Um, it was done in two parts. Part of it was figuring out what the tolerance of the community was um, for right. the security yeah. upgrades. The other part of it was to get a, a feel for um, the climate within the schools um, from both the perspective of the students, um, the faculty, mm -hmm. and the parents. So all that data is there. I can give you if you guys want it. It's a lot to pour through. Um, basically. It was one of the reasons, the, the results that we got, we brought in Cal Calvin Terrell. Um, that was kind of a response to it. Um, and also the recognition that um, the students feel incredibly safe with the staff. They always feel that they've got somebody on the staff to turn to. Yeah. I mean, that was some of the highest ratings I've ever seen in any, any district. No, I um, remember that. And yeah. I remember that survey. I guess I, I was looking more for staff satisfaction and right. you yeah know, and that's what the by administration and um, just the quality of yep. teaching yeah. life within our district I just think you know when we talk about treatment of staff I think it's really essential that we have some yep. sense of how mm -hmm. people are feeling as in this workplace yeah. and that's the the that's the state I mean we can we can run one if you want but that's happening this spring um, yeah. Okay. So and it has so it hasn't happened this past spring. They 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 they're, they're, they're developing they're it, developing it as part of the federal reform the next spring. So it'll be in every it'll be nice because every school in the I keep, I keep almost saying Commonwealth in Vermont mm -hmm. um, will be administering it so you can do comparisons if you want, which will be kind of nice. So they'll take it in the spring, and it, the results will be? Usually, if they take it in the spring, it'll be kind of like the SBAC. You know, you would expect to have the results, you know, mid-September. Okay, um, so a year from now, really. Yep. Yeah. But if I can get the, the copy of the, um, of the one that we used, like I said, Tina's searching through the database to find it. Um, she did find it. We did send a copy of it out last year to folks, and it didn't, uh, didn't go anywhere um, in terms of the discussions. Um, the other thing that I sent out last year, which I can send out again, is the Marblehead survey. Um, I had two PhDs that um, worked in metrics um, who pulled the community together and actually did it. This is a huge survey, um, but it touches on every aspect that you could possibly imagine. Some of them, the questions in there wouldn't apply to us, but we could also adapt that as well. Um, so if you're interested, I could send that out for a preview to see if it's fitting what you guys are have you seen the Vermont, what, what Vermont's proposing? Still in, de still in development. I've seen the categories of, of what they're looking for, um, and it touches on all the pieces uh, that you've discussed. Um, there is a little two-page overview. Um, I'll email out to you. Okay. Let you guys know that'll help kind of inform what you're thinking. Yeah, I, I think for me, a stopgap, just because uh, yep. it, it, we're, we're talking about next year, this time, that we would be able to look at 
for for this spring. And so I'm, I'm thinking between now and then, I'd like to know how they feel if we haven't done it for years. Yep. I, I, I feel like we, we've asked for this a couple of years. I know it's not you we've asked yep. for a couple of years, but we've asked for this. And I think this is something I would like to see, even if it's just very basic. Do you feel like you're being... You know, you're you're being respected. Do you feel like you're 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 whatever? The workers value. I can right. I can you easily. You're I supported can, and you know. Right. You know, do you just feel the, academically supported? Do you feel mentally supported? You know, all mm -hmm. these kind of. Yeah. I can pull together something easy enough. It's 20, 30 questions. Like I yeah. said, I can get the research base. I can do it in two, three days. I yeah, think that exactly. would be really helpful okay. as a board for us right. to get a sense yeah. of. You know, helpful for me too. You know, and going into <laughs> negotiations and and you right. know thinking yeah. of, of what we need to budget for. You know, it just is really important information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, let's plan on next meeting. I can do a presentation. Like I said, I'll try to I'll pull together. Uh, hit the, the base, I'll try to pull together about 30 questions. Should be a good topic, but on general general climate in terms of interactions with administration, do you mm -hmm. want it to go beyond that? Do you want it to also be in our, okay. No. Mm -hmm. No concerns around CBA or anything like that? Or doing uh, a survey like that? I, I don't, I'm asking because I can completely. What would the I don't think CBA so. aware, I don't but I just want to. I don't know that we can. Well, no, I just want to make sure Are that... Are allowed to... I, I guess my question is, is it, yeah, that's my question is, yeah. a, question? is that doing a survey of staff, are, are we as a board and as a superintendent, is that allowable and, or is that something that, I, I'm just I asking... I see why it would not be. To make I mean, sure that we're... We're not... We're not stepping into territory that is not within our purview. If that's the only no. reason I bring it up. Well, with this, I don't know if we can with the CBA. Like, we're not do, asking about the CBA. No, well, but I guess we're, we're, we're not. We're not asking. We're not evaluating the staff. No. Okay. If the okay, survey yeah. were evaluated of the staff in, right. in some way, then they would have should have a say in. Yeah. If that's okay. the question. Yeah. yeah. No, I guess I just I just ask from a perspective of not necessarily. Yeah. Right. You know, knowing yeah. all the parts and pieces, and just wanting to make sure that it's been considered, and and that we're just not. We're staying within. Mm -hmm. you know, no, I think, and I think it's especially are. important now because we're, you know, starting tonight to think about you know renewing a superintendent's contract, right. a new yeah. superintendent's contract. I think it's Im important for us to be better informed. Yeah. Absolutely, of, yeah. No, I, I think the information yeah. will be really helpful, and and mm -hmm. uh, as a board perspective, I just want to make sure that it, it's yeah. within our purview. Right. Yeah. So um, let's just make sure that everyone has done due diligence and read these um, two reports thoroughly so we can um, make sure that we're going to properly uh, monitor our superintendent on um, these two policies. Um, so review these um, reports thoroughly for next meeting and then we can accept them. All right. Advocacy. Um, this isn't me. So we've got, um, there's two meetings, the VISBIT and the VHI um, meetings. They stand for Vermont School Board's Insurance Trust. Trust. <laughs> and Vermont Employees um, Educators Health, health Insurance. Insurance. Yeah, yeah, Health Insurance. So um, <clears throat> Ann Howard has gone to these meetings. Um, these meetings happen at Lake Maury. Um, I think it's October 18th, 18th and 19th. 18th yeah. and 19th. Um, does anyone have interest in going? Um, they are annual meetings. Um, school board members, superintendents um, attend, and we get a vote. So if none of us is going, um, we will uh, give our, our vote to another uh, advisory union. Supervisory yeah, I think union, the, right? the proxy, I believe, is, yeah, right. You're right. Like the advisory goes board to the for the yeah. Goes to the state board. Yeah. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Gets to make the decision. So is anyone interested in going? Okay. I will also ask Anne Howard, because she has gone um, occasionally in the past. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, I guess we need to vote to... Um, so otherwise, give our 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 proxy vote to the um, VSBA Vermont School Boards Association. Um, so, can I have a motion to, in the absence, to either allow Ann Howard to cast our vote, or to um, give a proxy vote to VSBA? 
I'll make that motion. Second. Linda, do you need me to say it again? I'll second. <laughs> no, I can figure it out. You get it? it? All right. Yep. All those in favor? So we get Paul and we get Melody. Any Aye. Any other discussion before we vote? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Great. I will um, run that by Ann Howard, too. I'll send her an email and just ask if she wants to go. All right. Um, the consent agenda. We've got minutes from the September meeting, um, which took place in Brookfield. That's included in the packet. Mm -hmm. We also have to approve professional contracts. Um, that was uh, our driver's education, yep. um, which are currently working this semester. Um, we also have to authorize name changes of school representatives to People's United Bank. What's that about, Linda? Wasn't that where they had they had some old names, people that don't even work for us anymore? On a okay. scholarship. Remember that was account. Robin had said. Okay. Yeah, so they're just changing the names. From I mean, it's like, like an David old Barnett. school counselor. It just okay. hasn't worked for us for a few years. Okay. The bank's just catching up, I guess. <laughs> okay. Would someone move the consent agenda? I can move the consent agenda. Okay, thanks. There you go. I guess Kate. so. All right, go, Kate. Okay. Second. I'll second. There you go. Move, move it along. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Consent agenda passes. Um, reports and incidental information. We have Lane, your report. Um, which is enclosed here. Is there anything else to add? A couple, a couple incidentals, and we've also got the, the financial. Um, finances look good. Um, if you see the financial report in there, if you take a look at the last two pages, the last column is the percent um, of what was budgeted for that still exists. So like if it says 75%, it means that we spent 25% of it so far. What I usually do is um, I pretend that our spending is linear and then I figure out how many months have passed and then I kind of divide it into there. So right now, um, if everything is linear, which it's not, um, you would expect there to be 75s in each of those right now. Um, if it's significantly lower than that, then that's usually things I question. If it's significantly higher, um, I don't worry about it too, too much. Um, so does anything stand out to you as being um, uh, worrisome as far as our finances? No, going? everything looked good. The the one that might jump out at folks is a negative 42% for the bus fund. Mm -hmm. um, that's just because we haven't paid ourselves back yet. We, we paid money out of, uh, out of that account line, and we were paying ourselves back with the money from the surplus fund that you guys approved mm -hmm. if we don't have money left at the end of the year to cover. Mm -hmm. So we don't do that transfer until the end of the year if we don't have money um, in, in, in our regular budget left over that we can use to account for it. So that'll look a little bit funny, but that's just because it hasn't been reimbursed. So I should drop each one of those lines. If it were linear, should drop 8.33% per month. <clears throat> How's our enrollment? You're going to, I'll do that presentation for you. Later? Yeah, okay. that'll be next month. Uh, we'll talk about, like I said, I got all the data. Usually October 1st around, you pull the data because that's when, you know, the kids have kind of settled down, you know, who's actually coming, who's not. That's, I saw that somewhere. Where yeah, it was in the, in the elementary report. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the water of this, the Brookfield School? So I sent an update out to the Brookfield community. Um, Research-wise, uh, the plumbing is old. Um, so the two pieces that you worry about then um, are obviously lead solder. Um, and, but the piece where they think that this contamination is coming from are the valves and the faucets. Um, they sometimes use lead in the valves. Um, so those faucets are all being replaced right now to see what the impact um, was. Um, they do the testing, you know, they, they don't test every water outlet in the building. They, they choose a sampling. There was only one um, that tested positive. Oh, really? it, was a, it was a classroom faucet. And probably because the testing was in August, you know, the water had sat mm. in there for a considerable amount of time. 
Um, typically with faucets, what most schools do is instead of replacing this stuff is they just have the, the facilities folks come in and run the water for a couple of minutes in the morning and that, that makes it fine. But we're going to replace the faucets and we're also taking a look, I should say uh, Wes and, and Bob are taking a look at what the cost is uh, to replace the plumbing um, if there is lead solder there. Um, odds are because the lead solder is on the outside, you know, mm. it shouldn't be getting in, but you never know. So, so that should be resolved pretty darn quickly. You'll do a follow-up lead test then? Yep. Yeah. Um, we, we have a copper and lead test plan that's in place, so it happens periodically anyway. But obviously, um, you step up the testing um, as you're doing this work. So, yeah. Yeah. Any updates on the well after the, the work that was done? It, uh, and again, it's, it wasn't the water fountains. Um, it seemed to be okay. There were kids that were routinely using the water fountains. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's perfect. Um, it still has a little bit of a, a salty taste to it, but nothing like it was. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no lead. There's no lead, yeah. So we're waiting, um, we're waiting for the report. I asked them to get another full sampling of all the dissolved solids in there. Um, just to see what the change was. So hopefully that'll be in for next month and we can take a look at it together. Great. Um, as the update. Is there anything else to add? Um, finances. Uh, so a couple things, real quick stuff. Um, so Ben, Ben and Linda um, are working together. Um, there is a, a link up on the OSSD board portion of the website that currently has the agendas and the minutes, but they're getting the packets, finding a way to get the packets up there as well ahead of time. Um, Ken Kadao um, is working with the students in the new makerspace that we built this year um, to make the nameplates that uh, a couple of members um, of the community has suggested he's gonna use the new laser cutter that they have to right. create those. Um, so hopefully by next month. Um, talk about this one first, and then we'll go back to the R3 initiative. Um, have been talking uh, with the town about the rent for the bus garage. Uh, we'd spoken about that about a month ago. Um, we did do our, our due diligence. Uh, we checked the two town garages. Brookfield, it's not possible. Um, they don't have the, the space. Um, Braintree does in the garage, but they don't have the space on the grounds. Mm -hmm. They've got eight acres up there, but it's not um, a place that you can actually uh, park the buses too easily. And their intent would be to move out of that space completely if we were to take it and go build something else elsewhere and leave us you know you know on that space so i don't know what the rent would be on it um, the other possibility um, that i've had two discussions with the tech center folks about is expanding um, the automotive diesel program um, would require building a shell uh, of a building uh, to do but they've got enough folks that you know they could double the size of the diesel program it would mean bringing in a new staff member to do it because they're only allowed to have about 16 kids in a class um, but we could do that or more importantly the thing that came up in the other meeting because we've been talking about finding some sort of anchor program um, Developing a program to teach the students how to work on the electric cars mm. um, Which is the up-and-coming technology right now that, that's not out there. So though that's kind of in discussions um, Building that building that space out there What it would do is it would give us a place to put the buses and the students would maintain them um, as well But it would give us space to do other things with where, where would this be be potentially right out uh, back behind the building um, on the parking lot Do we have space for that? Yeah, where would the you have to have to look a little bit, but they they seem to um, Enough was, to park our what, well, what, bus, eight buses or five buses? Uh, those what we could do is if you go to the side the Raven building is on um, there's a, a lot of space, a lot of grass between the current parking lot that's there and the Raven Building. We could just extend that a little bit. That's where they park all the big big rigs that they're working on anyway mm -hmm. right now, but we can make the space a, a bit larger. Mm -hmm. um, what they were talking about is if they you know, were maintaining the buses, and it would actually help them in terms of the program that they have now, is having a space where you can actually do a drive-through. Um, so instead of having to you know pull that mm -hmm. big rig into a limited space, mm -hmm. then back it up out of which is uh, pretty tricky and dangerous mm -hmm. to uh, straight drive through so is this would this save money or what is what is the goal so the the goal of this one is um i don't think it would save any money um but if it were combined with advancing academic programs and building new academic programs that might increase our enrollment Mm -hmm. um, you get that balance. Um, in talking with Adolfo, uh, what they came up with for rent is 25000 a year. 
Um, it's currently about 12. Um, the reality is that's very realistic. I mean, we were paying mm -hmm. dirt cheap. You pay more, you know, that 12,000 a year is what people pay for a good apartment around here. Um, and then the guarantee, if, if we go for the 25,000, is that that will not increase for 10 years. Mm -hmm. We're not signed into a lease. We can back out at any time, um, but there, there will be no increase for 10 years. Um, and so that, that sounds the most reasonable. Um, to me and looking at all the possible options mm -hmm. do that and, and still explore the potential for an academic because since we're not blocked into a lease you know three years down the road we find out it's more cost effective it'll really build a program that it might be worth examining mm -hmm. um, so which was good so um the town initiative so you've got the r3 project the the uh, randolph re-envision project one of the things that the group has been talking about is lowering the tax burden um, by putting solar on all the town buildings. Um, are you back there? So Adam, Adam was here. Yeah, he's, he's here. Adam pulled together a proposal um, for our most expensive school in terms of electricity per student. Um, which is Braintree, it's the building we're sitting in right now. Um, so it's about 1700 a month for the electricity for the building. Um, on a kind of a first glance, and he does a pretty good job uh, with his estimates, uh, the cost of the system would be 194000 uh, We've got a metal roof. Um, you could get the system up there, it would pay itself back in 10 years. Um, and then after that, for the next you know, 15 years or so of the, the good usable life uh, of the system, it would be free. But from the day it is built, um, it would be a zero cost for electricity from that point forward. Um, so ideas to, to throw out there. And you know, Adam, I, if you guys are OK, invite him to, to speak a little bit. It might be nice to um, set it up on an agenda for a future yeah, board meeting to have a full discussion it's about not it. really uh, on the agenda right. I, I would like to okay discuss it. throw it out mm -hmm. the but other like to make sure community members are here to yeah voice the other reason it's pertinent um is uh, randolph elementary um we're ready to replace the roof oh. um and so if we decided to do something like this across the schools that would be an ideal time because it could be integrated in that repair right so would we have to do anything with this roof Drill a couple of holes in it and, and put the uh, uh, put the metal gridding up there. There's actually but actually it's strong. It's it's sturdy and strong enough to to bear the weight of a solar project. Yeah. So what do you think? We, we don't have time for a huge discussion, sure. but just as a Can brief. A question, yeah. Which isn't much. Face is the right direction. Well, you're eighty percent. is not perfect, but it's uh, plenty good enough to make it work well for you. Mm -hmm. And then the technology, you know, is advancing the uh, the lifespan of the solar panels is now. I mean, they, they, they start to drop off over time what they produce, but, you know, probably 25 years of useful life. And Lord knows what the technology will be in at that time, and it's just a matter of swapping out the panels. Um, it's not the full, full work um, at that point in time. So, again, I, I think if folks are interested, it would be worth having a, a full discussion about it. Mm -hmm. Is there currently any solar on any of the buildings in the district? No. Okay. The other, other piece this plays into is part of the, um, the R3 work that they're doing. Um, they want to get some charging stations in town. You know, one of the places they were looking at doing that is at, at one of the schools. Um, again, so we start thinking about, okay, so we've got the electric cars, the, that program here. You know, we can teach the kids a little bit about the technology and maintaining the tech that supports those cars. Um, so there, there are lots of possibilities there. But, you know, if we got them up on the Randolph High School, um, you know, we can support that program, support those charges, and, and pay a little bit into the electric. Um, I think Adam had mentioned that there's a limit to how much electricity you're allowed to produce. Mm. And something like, a, uh, you know, the, the high school, um, you know, we would, we, we would, uh, its usage would exceed what we'd be able to produce by law. So, you know, some interesting parts and pieces. I'm learning a lot just in talking mm -hmm. to folks. Thank you. <laughs> it sounds like we're moving to electric buses anyway. 
There was just on the news today. They were talking about electric buses. Yeah. Yeah, we, we had we had that? we had yeah. some discussions about that. If you know, build a full charging station. They had, there's a, a two people on that um, committee that are going to reach out to like Tesla um, to see if they can get a grant so we can be a model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Charge. When you say we like state, or are you thinking about district? Okay. Yeah, district. that's what's wrong. Yeah. They were talking yeah, about so there, there are some grants oh, really? out there to be able to yeah. get those those free, and the maintenance on them is you know except for the batteries the, the battery technology is what drives them maintenance on an electric mm -hmm. motor is minimal it's nothing mm -hmm. um, so lots of cool stuff I would like to see this put on an agenda yeah mm -hmm. would you be willing to come back and present to us at the beginning of a meeting absolutely would be great yep. I have um, preliminary designs for all schools. Okay. Yeah, it that is. would be that would be great. If folks decided that it would it would have to go out to bid just by, yeah, by state law, but it's, right. he's got a pretty good handle um, on it, and he's local, which is nice. Mm -hmm. And a graduate, right? Yeah. <laughs> Born and raised right here, and educated here, and UPC as well. So. Okay. That's it, unless there's questions. All right. Are we ready for the board evaluation? So the back of this seems like true or false, right? Like <laughs> yeah, governance, right. governance principles seems like true or false. Doesn't seem like you can kind of score that. So I, I think we met all those. Um, <laughs> and then I, gave, <laughs> then I gave us threes for just about everything, acceptable for just about everything. Um, the agenda was well planned uh, to focus on the work of the board. The board followed its agenda, did not get sidetracked. Things took longer than we expected, but it was all. It's always my fault. It, it was definitely your fault. <laughs> it was all, it was all <laughs> relevant. It was all relevant stuff true. and good discussion, I think. The meeting was well attended. Um, the board was prepared for the meeting. The meeting proceeded without interruptions. The board's decision making process were understood and implemented appropriately. Diversity of viewpoints were sought out and considered. Participation was balanced. Everyone participated. No one domin dominated. Members all listened attentively as each participant spoke and avoided side conversations. Um, participants treated each other with respect and courtesy. Work was accomplished in an atmosphere of trust and openness. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You can submit that to Linda. I'll just check these out. <laughs> All right. Um, so we are going to move into executive session. So um, thank you all for attending.